Welcome to Hot Chips 32. Session 4. GPUs and Gaming Architectures. NVIDIA, where he's uh, led several generations of, uh, of uh, streaming multiple processor architecture developments. And Wish is a senior director of architecture, wherein he has led the architecture development of GPU memory systems for multiple generations. So please welcome Jack to begin the presentation. Hi. Today we're going to be talking about NVIDIA's new Ampere architecture and the A100 GPU. This new GPU provides unprecedented acceleration at every scale. Building on the groundwork laid by our prior GPU architecture, we've added powerful new features which deliver significantly faster performance for HPC, AI, and data analytics workloads. This is a record-setting GPU. Fabricated on TSMC 7 nanometer process, the A100 includes 54 billion transistors. It has 108 SNs with over 6,900 CUDA cores 40 megabytes of L2 cache, and 1.6 terabytes per second of HBM2 memory bandwidth. On the right, we highlight A100's new Elastic GPU features. With its new multi-instance GPU and process isolation features, A100 could scale out, securely partitioning into as many as seven separate GPU instances for different users to run CUDA applications. A100 also scales up with enhanced features for multi-GPU communication, performance, and reliability, including third-generation NVLink and NVSwitch inter-GPU communications. All these enhancements provide a huge 2x to 7x improvements over our previous, previous industry-leading V100 architecture. Inside the A100SM is the new third-generation Tensor Core. When we launched Filter three years ago, Tensor Cores revolutionized the then nascent field of deep learning acceleration. A100's new Tensor Cores double down and more. It's both faster and more efficient, it adds comprehensive data type support, and it boosts performance even more with new sparsity feature. We've also added a number of new features to the SM to support feeding data to the Tensor Cores, as well as improve performance and efficiency for general compute applications. These include new asynchronous data movement instructions and new asynchronous barriers, which work together to greatly improve the efficiency of fetching data from memory into the SM. On top of that, we increased the SM's L1 and shared memory capacity by 50%. Here we see that A100 achieves substantial performance improvements across different HPC applications. We see A100 running from around 1.5x to over 2x faster than V100 across the board on important applications within molecular dynamics, physics, engineering, and geoscience. In the NVIDIA Arc Ampere architecture, for the first time, we also bring tensor core acceleration to HPC with IEEE compliant support for FP64 matrix multiply operations. For DL workloads, DTX superpods with A100s have set records for ML at birth benchmark, handily beating out all other commercially available systems including Google's TPU V3 and Highways Ascend systems. The benchmarks also demonstrate A100's breadth of support for AI networks, the only system able to run all benchmarks and run them all with high performance. A100 also dominates in per chip performance, setting ML perf records and handily beating out all other commercially available chips. Even when you include not commercially available systems like Intel's upcoming Cooper Lake CPU and Google's TPU V4 research chip, A100 has industry-leading performance. Now we're going to go deeper on just a few of the features and capabilities of the A100. We're going to show how A100 enables strong scaling from top to bottom. We'll show how scale up and scale out is achieved through A100's elastic GPU features. And finally, we'll show how we enable efficiency and productivity via our asynchronous programming features. 
First, I'll dive deeper into the, into the architecture improvements we've made for strong scaling. Essentially, how we keep the tensor course fed with continuous streams of data. First, on the left, we have a very high level overview of how we run DL networks on a GPU. A typical net neural network consists of long chains of interconnected layers. Networks require massive compute, but the parallelism is broken up into small sequentially dependent chunks of work. Each layer performs an operation similar to a matrix multiplication, taking on input activation tensors and multiplying with weight tensors to create an output activation tensor. To map onto the GPU, the output tensor is broken down to smaller tiles and each SM works on one tile. A100's tensor cores run 2.5x faster on the B100 for dense FP16 data. So how do we scale that performance? One easy way to target this is through weight scaling, where the workload must grow to leverage the faster architecture. We could, for example, have a 2.5 increase in network back size. In A100, we targeted the harder to achieve strong scaling, where the workload size remains fixed and we must run them much faster, which equates to 2.5 speed X over V100 on fixed size networks. We can see that this constrains the workload parallelism per GPU and per SM. First step to strong scaling is to be able to process things faster. This starts with our new tensor core throughput. Here are the relative throughputs for V100 and A100's tensor cores. I won't go over them in detail, except to point out that processing of FP16 data has been improved by 2.5x for GPU for dense data and 5x for sparse data. This corresponds to 2x per SM for dense data and 4x for sparse data. And for processing FP32 data, We've added the TensorFlow32 operation that improved the processing of FP32 data by 10x for GPU for dense data and 20x for sparse data. This corresponds to 8x per SM for dense data and 16x for sparse data. The key challenge is how do we keep the tensor cores fed? On the left, we show the math bandwidth of different types of data types on a log scale. On the right, we see the required data bandwidth of supplying operands to the tensor cores for different data types. There are a couple of key things to notice in this bandwidth chart. First, the scale on the y-axis is in kilobytes per clock per SM. Tensor cores consume a massive amount of data. Second, a 100 fast tensor cores dramatically increase the bandwidth demand. Dense operations consume input data twice as fast as V100, and sparse operations consume data three times as fast. This is because the sparsity, the math rate is double, but only the weights are compressed and not the activation. Now we'll walk through the A100 innovations we've designed to meet this strong scaling challenge. We've improved speeds and feeds, and perhaps more importantly, efficiency throughout the architecture. We'll start in the SM and work our way down through the memory system. Let's start with the SM core. First, let's look how the tensor cores are fed from the register file. We have four warps working together on a large matrix multiply. The V100's eight thread tensor cores, data need to be loaded four times from shared memory into the different thread registers. In A100, the 32 thread tensor cores reduce the shared memory load bandwidth by half. Now let's look how data gets into the SM. In V100, low global instructions transfer data from L2 and DRAM through the L1 cache and into the register file. Then stored shared instructions write the data into shared memory. In A100, we have a new combined low global store shared instruction, which transfers data directly into shared memory, completely bypassing the register file. We call this instruction an asynchronous copy, and threads continue executing after they issue it. Overall, A100 has a 3x improvement on in shared memory bandwidth and HAL1 bandwidth. On top of that, in orange, we highlight the SM storage that preserve for in flight memory requests. And we can see that A100 is twice as efficient. In addition to improving efficiency within the SM, these features and increased shared memory capacity enable A100 SMs to continually stream data, improving utilization throughout the memory system. Now I'll pass it off to Wish to talk about the strong scaling in our memory system. Now, we look at how data moves in the memory system to support strong scaling.
strong scaling effects, how much bandwidth can be extracted from the last level cache or the L2 and the DRAM controller on the GPU. To set the stage for the increase in bandwidth of the L2, let's start by recalling that layers in the neural network are parallelized across all SMs in the GPU with tiles. A smaller tile size allows A100 to strong scale with the increased number of SMs on A100. The first picture compares the L2 bandwidth requirement as we decrease the tile size down to 128 by 64. The required L2 bandwidth doubles near saturation at 94%. If we increase the number of SMs to match A100, but keep the memory system intact, the L2 bandwidth is far oversubscribed. This will lead the SMs to be underutilized. In A100, we increase the number of L2 slices to 80, while also doubling the per slice bandwidth to 64 bytes per clock. SMs are better utilized with this configuration. However, such a large increase in bandwidth is not optimal from area or power required to move high bandwidth data inside the GPU. We need a major innovation in the memory system to support this higher bandwidth. The figure on the right shows how we achieved this by restructuring the L2 into split partitions with a hierarchical cross power structure. Each partition of the L2 cache contains data nearer to the SM based on the access pattern, hence reducing distance traveled by an L2 head. Hardware cache coherence maintains a CUDA programming model across the full GPU. Applications automatically leverage the bandwidth and latency benefits of the new L2 cache. But that's not all. On-chip data reuse is the best way to improve DRAM bandwidth. To support reuse, we increased the L2 capacity by almost 7x and we also made the L2 smarter. We added L2 residency controls, which give programmers tools to maximize L2 efficiency. The diagram shows an example where we have A and B ping pong buffers between the kernels and the colored portions are marked for persistent caching in EL2. The buffer C is marked to stay in L2 across reads by two different kernels. We make this work with new mechanisms that configure a portion of the L2 for persistent data. Allocation is specified either with address range based controls or final grain per access controls. Fractional allocation such as seen with buffers A and B is supported with an address hash. Persistent data has priority for L2 caching but other accesses can still use the full L2 if persistent data is not present. Next up, we have DRAM bandwidth. In terms of raw speeds and feeds, an additional HPM2 side and faster clocks increase bandwidth to 1.6 terabytes, a 1.7 increase over 100. To improve resiliency, the hardware implements the hardware page remapper on a per bank basis. To boost bandwidth efficiency even more, A100 adds a compute data compression feature. Plots on the left show the unstructured sparsity we have seen in activations of convolutional neural networks. We can see that sparsity of many layers is over 50% on average. To exploit this type of sparsity, A100 adds compression of data within the L2 cache shown by the transition from blue to purple in the right diagram. For compressed data, we save up to 4x DRAM and of course L2 bandwidth. Even if compression does not help the memory footprint, compressed data can double the L2 capacity. To complete the strong scaling speeds and feed stack, we take a look here at how A100 connects to other GPUs. With the third generation NVLink, we have doubled bandwidth per GPU to 600 gigabyte per second bidirectional. It is almost 10x PCIe Gen 4. This is accomplished by going to 50 gigabit per second signaling and doubling up to 12 links per GPU. In the next section, we will talk about how to use NVLink to build multi GPU systems. To wrap up this section, this slide summarizes the speeds, feeds, capacity, and efficiency improvements we've made in A100. With architectural innovations, we have two to three X improvements starting from the TensorCore math bandwidth at the top. 
then going down through the register file and shared memory bandwidth and capacity where we gain efficiencies with the new tensor core and async copy instructions. Then to the large gain in L2 bandwidth and the new split structure, increased L2 capacity along with residency controls for reducing DRAM bandwidth and then down through DRAM and NVLink. We are going to dive deeper in is how we design for an elastic GPU which aids in supporting both scale up and scale out in a single system design. This picture shows the configuration of the DGX system updated for A100. There are eight A100 GPUs connected within the box with six high bandwidth NVLink 3 switches. Each NV switch has 4.8 terabyte per second bidirectional bandwidth. New features in A100 and the updated NVLink 3 protocol allows for better error attribution within the DGX. This means that errors are conveyed back to the executing context for all transactions. There are nine Meranox Connectic 6 controllers that allow scalability across multiple DGX systems. A scalable unit is the building block of the network that consists of 20 DGX systems. Each scalable unit consists of a leaf and spine network architecture. One configuration of a scalable unit has eight leaf and four spine switches. Multiple scalable units, or SUs, combine to build out a 1K GPU superpower cluster. 140 nodes form a superpower that consists of many leaf spine switches connected to core IB switches. Extending further, Multiple superparts can direct connect to one another with the distributed core IB switches. Network topology used is a full fat tree for compute and a separate network for storage. Modularity provided by the design is exploited in making the pod structure extensible. For workloads that don't automatically scale out for the extensibility of the A100 system, it is possible to expose multiple instances of the GPU on A100. The goal of A100 with MIG is to fully utilize a single GPU. With MIG, you can enable GPU sharing and high utilization. Each instance of the GPU executes a completely different CUDA application. There are two types of MIG instances. The first kind, compute resources are isolated and the OS can schedule processes on them. In the second type, Along with the compute resource isolation, hardware memory system is also isolated. This means physical paths through the GPU, the on-chip fabric, L2 cache, and the memory are independent of other GPU instances. MIG enables you to use each A100 as one large GPU or seven GPU instances. With NVSwitch and MATE, you can configure DGX with A100 as 56 GPU instances. The an example of this versatility is the picture which shows off a full DGX A100 working on one training problem or then the inference on the right where you could have one instance or seven instances of uh, the inference workload on a single A100. The elastic GPU is a very important area of focus for NVIDIA. DGX and MIG represent two key strategies to exploit scale up and scale out opportunities. Switching gears a little, Jack is going to continue talking about the productivity improvements with asynchronous programming model. I said earlier that A100 is the heart of a complex hardware and software system. Programmers are human beings, however, and have a finite ability to deal with complexity. Thoughtful architects need to be proactive in the support of programmers. In this section, we're going to be diving into the details of the new asynchronous program model enabled and accelerated by A100. When NVIDIA coined the term compute capability, we use it to refer to feature sets, like when a particular atomic operation was supported by the GPU. Nowadays, it does more. It tracks the space of valid GPU programs within which bulk parallel, parallel programs are only a small subset. In Compute 6.0, we added managed memory freeing the user from having to do so. In doing so, we address the biggest source of difficulty for new users, something which experts perhaps don't appreciate fully. Prior to this, every tutorial on GPU programming was firstly a tutorial on copying memory. 
but a modern tutorial today can focus on the algorithms much more. Next, in Compute 7.0, we brought all the concurrent programming to the GPU instead of having difficult to explain restrictions on the use of atomics in programs. We simply eliminated the restrictions. Now everything just works and works efficiently. It's rare that we can just erase difficulty from this world like that. This progression of programming models is deliberate. This is the right progression of addressing programming challenges and providing increased programmability, usability, and performance. Now let's turn our attention to the programming challenges that we most need to address today. In highly optimized kernels, we need to carefully orchestrate data movement and computation to keep the hardware working at the speed of light. You want to always be copying and always be computing. Unfortunately, the programming language is fighting you on this one, and it's true even of high-performance programming languages like C++. Two key reasons for this are the implicit notion of sequencing in the language, which you depend on the compiler to optimize away, such as on the left, and blocking synchronization, like what you see on the right. What you wish you could do is express that you want some more work to be done unsequenced, so that it can happen while prior work is still pending. It goes without saying, maybe, but you also want to solve this problem in a way that works with standard C++. So how are we going to do all this in that hardware capability? Today, we've enhanced the compute capability to version 8.0, a programming model revision that brings asynchronous programming onto the GPU in a way that's idiomatic for the GPU. This is the next progression of the GPU programming system one that's built on and enabled by our previously developed solid foundation. But wait, developing this capability was not done in a walled off way. The central abstraction for asynchronous programming on Compute 8.0 capable GPU is an ISO C++ 20 barrier object, which we dubbed an asynchronous barrier. It's asynchronous because the arrival on the barrier can be done without blocking letting you do some other unrelated work while the barrier phase resolving and other threads. And then you can block on completion of the barrier phase later at the point when you need it. I have to say, this makes us the first vendor to ship a conforming implementation of this facility among all the implemented C++ on any platform. We do have a few extensions to the C++ facility to aid additional optimizations of code. One example is being the thread scope template argument which limits the set of threads that are expected to use the object. You already know that barrier is only half the picture though. Asynchronous data movement is one of the key innovations in this architecture. This is embodied and included as an asynchronous mem copy, which asynchrony aside is as straightforward as you would expect. Next, down at the lower level of PTX, you find the hardware underpinnings of the barrier object, but also you'll find a set of asynchronous copy verbs that expand on the basic copy. Note that the PTX operation requires that you use shared memory functionality, but the CUDA C++ API only requires that shared memory be used for acceleration and continues to function regardless of where the memory is. Now, let's revisit our previous example and we can see this in action. On the left, asynchronous copies are associated with barrier objects. When threads block on the barrier, they block on the completion of all copies associated with the barrier as well. This is a second C++ extension we have made. On the right, I use the asynchronous barrier split and arrive interfaces, allow me to overlap computation while the barrier phase is unresolved. Then I block later when I need it to be resolved. In both cases, I put the barrier in shared memory to accelerate it in hardware on A100. I haven't showed the memories being copied, but for full acceleration, the source should be in global memory and the destination in shared memory. Okay, the real trick we're after though is doing both of these things at the same time and sustaining it for more than just operation. The next example is gonna be a bit more complicated, but we won't dwell on it for very long. Here, we're gonna use both asynchronous copies and asynchronous barriers, and we'll use them to form a double buffer data movement pipeline. I have my compute here. My initial copy here to get the pipeline going. My copy for every stage after initial one is here. The dependency for this copy is in the next iteration of the loop and it, incur, and it occurs in all but the last iteration. Finally, 
The barrier optics are orchestrating everything. There are two of them because the pipeline is double buffered. For a wrap up, I'd like to leave with some empirical evidence that productivity is improved. The first example is that immediately at launch, A100 is shipping with a vast library of kernels optimized to various key parameters. There are very many factors behind this, clearly, starting with the hard work by a lot of people. But also leaning into the program model of Compute 8.0 is a significant factor that made that work go further. The second example is the rising tide that lifts all boats. On the right is the relative performance of Cutlass, which is our open source C++ template library for linear algebra, compared to Kublas, our fastest implementation of dense linear algebra. For the most popular 16-bit tensor operation, the open source implementation using the new program model is now very close to parity in performance. And, it's, and this is just the beginning for A100. We think we're gonna get even closer. The NVIDIA Ampere architecture, A100, NVSwitch, HGX, and DGX systems are the work of thousands of engineers. Also DGX and EGX with Mellanox on board carry the work of thousands more. The entire team works as one from transistors, transistors to standards and everything in between like system integration and programming model design. That's how we delivered unprecedented acceleration at every scale. Thanks to the team and thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Jack and Wish. Uh, there's uh, a lot of interest in your presentation in the Slack channel. Looks like some of your uh, uh, NVIDIA colleagues have answered some of the questions, but I will uh, pick out some that they didn't and maybe a couple of really interesting ones that they already did for the, for the wider, uh, for the whole audience. Um, okay. Okay. First, uh, let's see, we have, uh, what voltage uh, does A100 uh, module use? I'm not sure what we're shipping voltage was. Do you, you remember which? No idea. No, we, we could probably look offline and get that 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 up, or look at the white paper and see what that is. Yeah, the the the, the, the questioner thought it was speculating that it was 48 volts supplied. I guess obviously to the to the overall module. Yeah. I don't know, but I have to look it up. Sorry. Um, so next question uh, is getting very specific. Um, on slide number 19, the questioner asks, the, the split L2 with a hierarchical crossbar, does this introduce multiple domains of latency in the L2? Uh, let me answer that, yeah. So actually, it doesn't uh, introduce multiple domains of latency within the L2. What it actually does uh, is make sure that it equalizes the latency of all the L2 heads. So basically, the way the split um, L2 works is it localizes data uh, to the requester. And then, you know, for a large chip like this, uh, if, uh, if you don't do that, then the, the, the latency difference between two requests is, ends up being fairly large. Uh, but with the spread L2 structure, the L2 hits end up being, uh, we have less latency variation between the L2 hits. Well, thank you. And, and our next question is uh, regarding the increased cache size from the previous generation. Uh, what, what improvements uh, have, have you seen uh, relative to that? Um, I can answer that as well. So, so basically, there are two uh, important things. What what happens is, I mean, obviously, it is application dependent. Some applications see a fairly large benefit uh, to the cache size increase. Uh, so, there are two aspects of the cache size increase. The bandwidth obviously uh, is a lot higher on a two hit. Uh, also, uh, the latency goes up. Uh, the latency goes down significantly because of the hit. So there are some specific benchmarks that uh, that we can look up, which actually uh, show significant improvement between, like, say, for example, V100 and A100 uh, because of the cache size increase. And then I just got a oh. Slack message from someone about the answer to the 48 volts. Yes, the, the module, I believe, is 48 volts. Oh, great. Um, so there's another question about cache, and it's asking, uh, 
would a uh, would a large L3 cache, have you considered having a large, I'm going to paraphrase it, but have you considered having a, a large L3 cache? Uh, yes, actually we have considered having a large L3 cache. Uh, it's a trade-off between uh, the capacity spent on the large L3 and the bandwidth that we can get from DRAM. And, uh, you know, we have found it more uh, beneficial to have a larger L2 uh, with higher bandwidth and then the remaining requests going to DRAM. Uh, the L3 adds one more hierarchy uh, in the cache structure. And, and in the cases where uh, there are not a lot of hits, uh, it has a significant imp uh, impact on, on the throughput mm -hmm. from a data movement perspective and, and the uh, power loss because of the extra lookup. And our next question is uh, not, not exactly about caches, but a little related. And the question is, where does uh, compression happen? Is it a, at the L2 cache level? And also, uh, the, the questioner also wonders if, is it zero compression, or is, there, is, there, uh, is it more complicated? Yeah, so I can answer that. Uh, so the, the compression actually happens at the L2. Right. What ends up happening is uh, you get uh, the data gets written into the L2, and then as uh, the evictions from the L2 happen, uh, we opportunistically compress data back into the L2. Uh, for the second part of the question about the types of compression, uh, uh, there are it's m more complicated than the, than just the zero based compression. There is obviously the sparse compression that has mostly zeros. And, but then we have a couple of other techniques that uh, we use to make sure that we can compress the data uh, in the L2. So it's, it's like the short answer is it's not as simple as just zero-based compression. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, time for just uh, two or three more questions. Uh, and then if you're... Um, if you guys are, are willing to, your colleagues, uh, the, the channel will be there, and, and perhaps you'll, you'll be able to answer some of the others there. But for now, is, because the next question is, uh, will there be NVLink support between the A100 and some CPU? I don't think we um, can talk about what... Yeah, we can uh, talk about that. What you we have our systems. Uh, we have the systems uh, announced. Um, as far as speculating what other systems we may or may not build, uh, we can't talk about that. Understandable. Um, and the uh, we'll make this the uh, uh, the last question. Um, what's the advantage of TF thirty two versus uh, B float sixteen? The main difference of TF32 versus uh, BFLOAT16 is that TF32 can actually operate on floating uh, FP32 math. You can just take FP32 inputs and the weights and activations uh, and process them um, with almost no uh, accuracy loss itself. And, and the reason for that is that it has the exponent range of FP32 and it has uh, more uh, mantissa uh, uh, range than, than you would have with regular um, FP16. So it's kind of like a, a or, or if uh, more mantissa range than if you just took an FP32 result and you truncated it down to 16 bits. So this extra precision in the mantissa and the extra exponent, full exponent in, in the uh, range basically allows us to run unchanged uh, FP32 uh, networks and run them with almost no loss. Well, thank you again, uh, both Jack and Wish. And uh, thank you, thank you. We greatly, I think the audience greatly appreciated your talk. All right. Thanks. All right, thank you. And our uh, our second presentation in this session is will be by David Blythe from Intel, and he'll be talking about the new XC GPU architecture. Uh, David's been developing GPU architectures and APIs for many years at Intel, and before that at Microsoft, where he and I first met, and, and at Silicon Graphics. And uh, actually, in his words, it's before GPUs were called GPUs. <laughs> um, 
He holds an undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Toronto, so please welcome David. Thanks, John. Today I'm going to talk about the work we have been doing on a new GPU architecture, but I'd first like to acknowledge that this has been a large team effort and that I feel privileged to come represent this information on behalf of the Intel GPU team. Intel has been investing in GPU architecture for more than 20 years, evolving through discrete graphics, chipset graphics, and integrated graphics. In our current work, we have embarked on a significant advancement in architecture and in our ambitions to encompass a much broader product space than previously covered by our integrated GPU architecture. To mark that change, we made a change in the architecture naming from Gen to XE. XE has its roots in the phrase Exascale for everyone. Before getting into the architecture details, let's talk about some of the goals for XE. We have some pretty ambitious goals. One, increase the scalability of the GPU from hundreds of SIMD lanes to many thousands. Next, provide great feature configurability to support SKUs for different workload specializations, media, 3D, AI, HPC, and others. Next, add additional features beyond those in the previous Gen 11 architecture, matrix tensor processing, reliability availability and serviceability features, ray tracing, virtualization, and others. And last but not least, significant performance, power, and area improvements compared to the previous generation. Meeting these goals was a major undertaking by the team and required a substantial amount of new architecture and design to move beyond the great work the team had previously done on Gen 11. The team took up the challenge with great passion. So let's go into some more detail of what we did. First, we'll go through some of the configurization or specializations of the architecture to meet target spaces, then describe the XE architecture from the outside in. Later, we'll go through the XELP microarchitecture, the one closest to product launch, for some more configuration and implementation specifics. First, on configurability. One aspect we noticed that there was both a desire and an opportunity to create more customized SKUs that are cost and performance optimized for different market segments. What I mean by that is not just scale the number of shader units up and down, but independently modulate other capabilities and throughputs. A simple and traditional example is floating point 64 throughput. It's super important in some markets, and other it just takes up space area leakage. Other examples are 3D fixed function, matrix processing, display, media processing, ray tracing. The XE architecture is parameterized and then mapped into four different microarchitectural variants that are configured for capabilities and performance requirements for different market segments. XELP for client integrated and entry discrete graphics. XEHPG for mid-range and enthusiast discrete graphics, XEHP for data center and AI, and XEHPC exascale computing. Over the last year or so, we have disclosed bits of information in various forms about each of these microarchitectures, including some new disclosures last week. As I go through the XE architecture, I'll try to provide some more insight into how they fit into the general architecture model. Next, let's talk about the high-level architecture and scalability. GPU architectural scalability is achieved by partitioning the architecture into modular building blocks that are replicated and interconnected with high bandwidth data buses. The main replicated building blocks in the XE architecture are the 3D compute slice, or just plain slice, which implements all of the programmable processing and 3D fixed function support, the media slice, which implements fixed function video, encode, decode, and video processing, and the cache interconnect fabric, which implements a multi-megabyte scalable multi-bank cache and fabric that interconnects the slices in external memory. Now let's go through these blocks in more detail. The slice is further partitioned into a set of sub-slices. These group programmable shaders that we call execution units with fixed function logic that together naturally scale through replication. These sub-slices are combined with additional geometry and pixel processing functions, slice common, that are statically provisioned for optimum slice size. The slice subslice partitioning has been present through multiple generations of Intel GPU architecture, going back to at least to Haswell integrated or Gen 7.5, but many details have changed from generation to generation to add new capabilities, improve scaling, and so on. One significant and necessary change we made was to move geometry processing from outside to inside the slice and have it work in a distributed fashion. The optimum slice size is always a good topic for architects to discuss. There's an analogy with slices and subslices too, between kitchen tiles and grout. 
For large systems or large area, bigger is better, but for smaller systems or more confined spaces, smaller is better. In XE, we've continued to maintain elasticity in this life size. Elasticity comes from modulating the number of subslices. So let's take a look at the subslice. The subslice includes thread dispatch, instruction cache, texture sampling, executing, execution units, and some other stuff. To provide more area and power efficiency for increasing configuration sizes, in XE, we grew the subslice from eight execution units to 16 execution units. So the slice configurability is in multiples of 16 EUs or 128 SIMD lanes. Other sub-slice assets, such as the 3D sampler, are scaled for commensurate throughput, but with net reduced gate count area and power. The sub-slice also adds hardware blocks for ray tracing, but I won't be able to share any more details today other than we have XEHPG parts in the lab. The XE sub-slice adds an L1 data cache along with texture cache and shared memory scratch pad. This L1 reduces latency and bandwidth to the L3 cache, improving performance and reducing power. I'll point out that the subslice also contains fixed functions to support programmable media processing, such as most estimation for encode and adaptive scaling. The capabilities and quality in that block continue to advance every generation. As we drive for greater configurability, we've made more of the elements such as ray tracing, 3D sampler, and media parameterized. Next, let's zoom in a little bit more and look at the execution units. The XE execution units include a thread controller, register file, branch and send units, and a set of vector or SIMD processing pipes. The vector pipes support floating point integer and extended math. XE also adds a matrix processing pipeline, which can be thought of as a 2D array of ALUs rather than a 1D array, and has support for deep learning focused data types such as float16, bfloat16, int8, and others. The execution unit supports co-issue of instructions to branch, send, and the vector pipes. However, the specifics of which arithmetic types for example, float 16, float 64, and integer that are combined together on a single issue port is dependent on the microarchitectural variant. I'll say a bit more later about the XELP execution unit structure. Popping back out to the top level, media processing can also be scaled independently in the form of media slices. Each media slice contains an encoder decoder block supporting a rich set of codec standards, ABC, HEVC, VP9, and others. A scaling and format conversion engine and a processing engine for video enhancement, such as denoising, deinterlace, HDR tone mapping. As in prior generations of the architecture, media and the main 3D compute block are encapsulated and exposed to software as separate engines with their own command stream within the same PCIe device. Each media slice operates independently from each other and from 3D compute, though software can distribute a high resolution stream across multiple media slices. At the center of the architecture is a coherent scalable memory fabric called XEMF that interconnects the compute and media slices, the L3 cache, and external memory subsystem. This fabric scales with the number of slices to preserve total flop to byte transfer ratios and typically carries terabytes per second of traffic. In the L3, the number of cache banks also scales with the fabric. The fabric is configurable for the number of slices and the number of ports or channels to the external memory subsystem. Using advanced packaging technologies, such as Fovros 3D stacking to connect the pieces together, Parts of the cache can be implemented in another die to create a significantly larger cache. This disaggregated cache is something we're implementing as part of the Ponovecchio design. The external memory system connects to the XEMF fabric through an adapter, GTI, that supports both integrated and discrete graphics. For integrated graphics systems such as Tiger Lake, the adapter connects directly to the SOC's internal high bandwidth infrastructure. For discrete GPU implementations, there's a separate scalable memory subsystem that is part of the discrete SOC infrastructure along with PCIe and display. And that memory subsystem supports different memory technologies, GDDR, HBM, DDDR. The architecture elements we described thus far are allow us to scale to large execution unit counts. Without saying the exact limit for a single die, we know we wanted to scale to thousands of execution units and that it would require going beyond a single die. To accomplish that, we worked with our friends on the advanced packaging side to employ a couple of key technologies. We architected the XEMF memory fabric to support node-level disaggregated interconnections, allowing large GPU implementations to be subdivided into physical silicon tiles and stitched together. The combined tiles can operate as a single PCIe device. We leveraged the EMID technology already in use to connect HBM memories to the GPU to physically connect the tiles together in a single package. This allows GPUs larger than a manufacturing reticle 
to be created in a single package. We're calling parts that use this technology multi-tile GPUs, and it is being used in XEHPC and XEHP designs. We have some XEHP multi-tile GPU parts running in the lab, and I'll say a bit more about them later in the talk. While we know that intra-package scaling allows designs of more than 1,000 execution units, we also know that the computational demands for supercomputing applications or deep learning training require scaling even further. The XE architecture allows a hub of inter-package links to also connect at the node level in the XEMF fabric. These inter-package links are named XE link. In the pun of Ekio XEHPC implementation, the XE link hub is implemented in a separate I.O. tile and also connected to the GPU tile using EMIP bridges. I've walked through the fundamentals of the XE architecture. Here's a simplified map for the four microarchitectures that summarize some of the attributes, including where they are in terms of fabrication and execution. You'll note that there is increasing complexity in going from left to right, and we have multiple microarchitectures in various stages of lab power on and testing. Now, having given a broad overview of the XE architecture, let's look in a bit more detail at the XELP microarchitecture specialization. The XELP microarchitecture is low power optimized, and we have disclosed several products that will make use of it. Tiger Lake Integrated Graphics, DG1 Client Discrete, and SG1 Data Center Discrete. Now, earlier today, Xavier presented Tiger Lake in the mobile processor session, and I'll add a bit more detail about the XELP microarchitecture inside of it with an eye towards the efficiency improvements that provide the underpinnings for all of the XE designs. One particularly audacious goal for Tiger Lake Graphics was to increase the 3D compute performance by roughly 2x at the same power envelope while not growing the die area in any appreciable way. Since this is still using 10 nanometer technologies, this is a pretty aggressive goal and required a concerted effort across architecture, microarchitecture, RTL design, circuit design, and process technology. Let's take a look at how we tackled this. First, we knew we wanted to increase the computational assets in the machine. So we chose 1.5x larger as the right target to achieve a good chunk of the 2x goal. At the same time, knowing that we had to scale up all of the assets proportionately to maintain balance in the machine, and at the same time, not substantially grow die area. So the 1.5x translates into a single slice configuration with up to 96 execution units that can execute 1,500 32-bit operations per clock and process 48 bilinear texels per clock through six samplers, maintaining the eight samples per subslice ratio, and up to 24 pixels per clock through three pixel pipelines, along with increasing the depth processing and other rates proportionately in slice common. The XE slice and subslice architecture changes we disclosed earlier help to reduce gate count and power or increase performance per flop. Let's talk about some other things that we did in the drive for 2x performance. Now we put that stake in the ground with growing the engine by 1.5x processing power. The rest of the 2x comes from a combination of two things, increasing frequency at ISO power and increasing the performance delivered by each flop, the performance per flop. Xavier talked about increasing frequency for the Willow Cove core, and in short, we did something similar by repipelining significant portions of the machine and taking advantage of some of the superfin process improvements. The graph on the right gives an idea of the resulting VF curve over the previous generation. Note that the envelope is extended compared to Gen 11 to provide headroom for high power implementations from the same RTL design. We also did more workload analysis and eliminated multiple small bottlenecks in the machine to improve both the 3D and compute performance per flop. More details of where we landed on the frequency and other KPIs will be available in the product launches in a couple of weeks. Again, I want to emphasize that doing all this at ISO power and near ISO area required a significant redesign of the microarchitecture. Furthermore, these changes were fundamental improvements that are part of the baseline of the XE architecture and implementation and, and are used everywhere in all of the microarchitectures. Now let's go back and look at the microarchitecture details of the execution units. They underwent a redesign to increase their efficiency relative to, to current workloads and reduce power and area. One general theme is, is increasing the effective SIMD width as wide as possible, but not so wide as to create lane utilization inefficiencies. We changed the thread controller to span a pair of execution units operating on 16 SIMD lanes. We also worked with the software team to move hardware scoreboarding into software inside the compiler. Gen 11 implements two four-wide floating point pipelines, with one also supporting integer arithmetic and the other extended math operations. In XELP, the two four-wide pipelines are combined into one eight-wide vector pipeline with integer arithmetic. This effectively doubles the integer rate compared to Gen 11. We further extended the integer processing capabilities of the vector pipeline 
with the addition of Perlane 8-bit 4Y.product function that accumulates into a 32-bit integer result. This is increases performance for AI inference and other computations that can exploit the 8-bit data type. Finally, we move the extended math into a separate two-wide pipeline that can co-issue along with the new vector pipe branch and send. Each XELP subslice contains an L1 data cache that is provisioned from common storage with the texture cache. As I mentioned before, the L1 reduces latency to, L to the L3 cache and reduces bandwidth demand. XELP supports L3 cache sizes up to 16 megabytes. The Tiger Lake implementation is 3.8 megabytes split across eight banks. The XELP fabric and memory system are sized to connect to the single large slice to the L3 cache and the SOC memory system. The GTI interface is doubled to support 128 bytes per clock to scale to the extra bandwidth provided by the Tiger Lake SOC fabric. XELP supports end-to-end -end color compression across 3D media and display to avoid decompressing data as it moves between blocks. And last but not least, the microarchitecture supports XEMF connection to local memory for discrete GPU implementations. The XELP media engine retains a similar architecture to that in Gen 11, but increases both the encode and decode throughputs by close to 2x across multiple formats, 444, 422, 420. It also adds AV1 decoder support and HEV screen content coding support. And we continue to drive frame rate and resolution with 4K and 8K 60 support and, and additional HDR display support for HDR10 and Dolby Vision standards. Also, we're targeting professional and prosumer applications by increasing fidelity with full end-to-end 12-bit -end color support. Now, usually I talk about display as part of the overall architecture at this point, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll have to save it for another time. XELP is ramping production in several products as I speak. But it's not the only XE microarchitecture that we have in our hands. We've had a little bit of time to exercise some multi-tile GPU XE HP parts in the lab. Here's a picture Raja tweeted a little while back showing a packaged two-tile XE HP part. And here's a very short video showing several of the parts in action in the lab. Welcome to Intel Labs, where our teams are hard at work around the world, testing and tuning our latest innovations. Today, they're working on something particularly special. Intel's first discrete GPU based on XE HP architecture. In these labs, we've leveraged Intel's unique packaging innovations for an industry first, multi tiled, highly scalable, and high performance architecture. This is XE HP. Let's take a look at what it can do. XE HP was created to be a media supercomputer on a PCIe card. Here, you'll see us transcoding a 4K video in real time, up to 60 frames per second, on a single stream. But we didn't stop there. By utilizing our industry-leading media IP and creating the most dense media architecture on a GPU, with FFmpeg, we can transcode up to 10 full streams of high-quality HEVC 4K video at 60 frames per second on a single tile. And you can see the FFmpeg output on screen, displaying the progression of real-time transcode of each frame. By optimizing for bitrate efficiency and stream density, customers are able to realize real-world TCO improvements for delivery of video content at scale. Along with media, we've placed compute throughput in the forefront of XE HP architecture, increasing the total number of execution units by over 100x when compared to XE LP. Viewing this through the lens of peak FP32 performance, XE HP covers a dynamic range of compute throughput with near linear scalability from one tile to two tile to four tile, and packing the most FP32 peak performance placed onto a single GPU package when measured by the CL peak benchmark. This unique combination of compute and media performance provides customers the flexibility to design for their most demanding applications. And we've only just begun. The video gives you some evidence of proof of life and scaling capabilities of the multi-tile GPU. On behalf of the entire team, I'm proud to report that we demonstrated a single package device that can achieve more than 40 single precision teraflops per second. I suspect there's still some headroom left in those numbers, but I'll have to leave you in suspense. Before I sum up, I know I'm going to get questions about what processor, what packaging technology is being used with what microarchitecture. Here's a summary table that covers the four microarchitectures that we published last week. I won't be able to add any additional detail at this time, though. There's been a lot of curiosity and enthusiasm about XE and our discrete GPU plans. While I had limited time and latitude in what I could cover today, 
hopefully I provided some insight into the XE architecture and where we are on it from an execution point of view. As products launch into the market, we will definitely provide more details, particularly around some of the capabilities present in the, in the other microarchitectures beyond XELP, you know, for example, ray tracing and matrix processing. In the meantime, I hope I've added some more fuel to the excitement and anticipation to see these products. The team has worked passionately to bring this architecture to fruition, and we're all looking forward to getting a broad set of products out to you all. So again, thank you for your time and attention. David, thank you. And you've definitely uh, inspired lots of questions, so let's get to them. Um, first question is, uh, will the XC matrix unit eventually be exposed through Intel's advanced matrix extensions? It'll definitely be, a, can you hear me okay first? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, it'll, so. it'll definitely get exposed through one API. The, the thing I sort of worry about is people maybe jump to what's the ISA a little too quickly, and I'm still at the school of trying to abstract the ISA, you know, so there'll be a low level API to get at it. Um, you know, if that helps answer the question. And next question is sort of on the same topic. Does Intel plan to open source the GPU driver code? Yes, yeah, that's part of uh, the XE plan in general for, for both the integrated and for the discrete parts. And next, um, why did Intel choose to go with one ray tracing unit per 16 execution units? Well, it's, it's the place where we inserted it. We thought the subsite scalability was the right place. And then the thing that I didn't mention was that the ray tracing unit, you know, its throughput itself can be modulated, um, you know, much like the, the, the matrix extensions as well, that it isn't just put a fixed size thing and that's the, that's the limit on the scaling side. Unfortunately, I can't give you more details just yet, but, but, but it had pretty good scalability, we feel, where we put it. Um, and now a, a very specific question. Um, on, slide on slide 11, there's a diagram with the tile-to-tile intra-package and XE-Link inter-package. Can you comment on the differences between them in terms of protocols? Sure, and there's a, you know, gonna be a few different questions about um, uh, what, you know, that, because uh, I talked about two different areas. One was, what do we do tile to tile? And that really is just an internal protocol. That's part of the, the overall XEMF. But when it gets exposed to the uh, outside, like when, you know, I had talked about uh, XE link, that um, you know, when it goes through the IO hub, or you think about it as being an adapter, then that protocol gets exposed. And I'm not giving the details of the, of the exact details of that protocol, other than it's a pretty lightweight protocol at this point, a little heavier weight than what goes from tile to tile. Um, but you know, one of the questions that also keeps coming up that I saw was, you know, how does CXL fit in this? And, and there is an intent to support CXL. And one of the things that we're still working through the details of how will XE link and CXL work together where you know, CXL is a bit heavier weight protocol still you know, in terms of uh, you know, cache currency and things like that. And next, there there actually been several questions uh, uh, also about linkage and communications between DAI um, along the lines of uh, can you discuss the communications and data sharing between CPU and GPU? Is there a yeah, coherency? So, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so and that's what I was alluding to when I mentioned that CXL. I think you know, Raja talked about it at the DevCon conference back last November that for the HEP, the H XE HPC uh, uh, microarchitecture that there was an in, there is an intent to support CXL as for um, CPU GPU coherence. And um, now turning to a slightly different subject, uh, what are the uh, the the question is why did you show the three D fixed functions as optional? When when would they be optional? <laughs> Yeah, and much as 3D is near and dear to my heart, that uh, at you know, in particular, when we started looking at things like the XA HPC microarchitecture, you know, we we actually did decide that we could make the 3D be optional, and so we at least wanted to make sure that the 
architecture supported that that you you know could basically turn off those pieces at at uh, design time um and you know there, there, these will always be be some amount of controversy but the thing that we're finding you know that one of the useful things or interesting things about gpus is that they have a lot of applicability but sometimes i just can't afford to carry everything along in every application that if i want to build a pure compute device or even a you know a, a pure ai device i don't necessarily have to have the 3d um, and I think we'll uh, we have just tell you, have time for a couple more questions. Um, how many threads could be executed in an execution unit? And that, that part we haven't fundamentally changed from some of the previous architectures. It uh, uh, changes a little bit from the microarchitecture. It might grow by one or two. Um, so in the uh, Tiger Lake, the, the XELP microarchitecture, it's seven. And it's a little bit little higher in the in the ones that we haven't really talked about the, the productization aspect yet. And finally, uh, for for this afternoon, what uh, can you comment on the API for ray tracing? Oh, well, we plan to fully support those standard APIs. You know, if we figure out something clever, you know, that we, we might want to do an extension here or there. But you know, generally, we we try to align with you know, Kronos, Microsoft, you know, everyone else that's doing the APIs. You know, and then for the data, sorry, I should, uh, but I should say for the the high end rendering side of of things, there'll be something as part of one one API for um, you know for more production type rendering, uh, ray tracing type stuff. And we haven't really given any details on that yet. But it'll, you know, other than it already exists for the CPU side through the Embry side of it, so there should be an assumption that that there'll be something that is compatible and fits in that one API family that works for the GPU. Great. Well, th thank you again, David. And let's uh, thank everyone. Thank you virtually. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Great. Um, and now our our last presentation for this session, but hopefully, hopefully, one everyone has been uh, looking forward to, is uh, by Jeff Andrews and Mark Grossman at Microsoft, and they will be talking about the Xbox Series X architecture. Um, Jeff's a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, where he leads the Silicon IP architecture in the Azure Silicon Engineering and Solutions organization. And uh, he's had a key role in Xbox architecture since the development of the first Xbox began oh, about 20 years ago, I think. Um, Mark is a principal architect and has been uh, responsible for the Xbox GPUs since the uh, first X, Xbox, you know, the first of the Xbox One series. And prior to, Mar to Microsoft, Mark was a co-founder of Silicon Graphics, and he's also worked at Evanston Sutherland, ATI, and AMD. So please welcome Jeff to begin the presentation. Thank you, John. Um, hello, thank you for attending our session discussing innovations and motivations behind the Xbox Series X Silicon architecture. I'll be covering system level, SOC level, and new Microsoft IP. Mark will follow with a more details about the new Microsoft GPU innovations. I'd like to call out three attributions. Um, first, thanks to our session chair, John Sell, who worked with us at Microsoft for 14 years as SOC architect lead on Xbox SOCs and is now at Intel focusing on security. I'd like to thank John for his tireless efforts on the Xbox Series X SOC, which he was great helping. Next, I'd like to thank the many hundreds of people within Microsoft, AMD, and TSMC who are directly responsible for the Xbox Series X Silicon, enabling the hardware and software for the console experience. Lastly, I wanted to thank Phil Spencer and Xbox Management that have enabled a, a tech innovation-driven approach to Xbox that put game developers first, enabling renewed Microsoft leadership in direct 3D software and hardware in, in our Silicon teams. This is empowering game developers to get technology out of the way and to deliver their vision to gamers worldwide. Okay. Here's a list on the next slide of key silicon inno hardware innovations in Xbox Series X that we have time to mention today. The first column is about CPU, GPU, and DRAM subsystem. I'd like to highlight our Zen 2 server class CPU cores, which we're really excited to bring to consoles. Hitting 120 hertz and ever larger living, breathing worlds required a transition from mid-range CPUs um, that we had the last couple generations to the best high-end out-of-order CPU cores. Next, um, the green items um, in the GPU 
which is the heart of the silicon end system, will be covered by Mark Grossman, our lead silicon graphics architect. The next column is about hardware accelerators. The Xbox Velocity architecture is all about enabling game engine developers the least amount of compromises to harness a large multiplier on their use of DRAM, leveraging the performance of NVMe SSD drives. Next, we have audio hardware engines enabling project acoustics and other audio processing. These engines are tailored for audio math. They provide reserved performance for audio designers to enable a huge uplift in audio experiences without conflicts with graphics and other workloads in the, end, in the system. I'll cover display a bit later. Lastly, we're going to mention some hardware innovations in Xbox hardware security, which has been significant starting with Xbox 360, but we nearly never discuss it publicly. The next slide shows a bit about the physical aspects of the chip. Um, the, the Xbox Series X SOC is in TSMC N7 enhanced and has more than 15 billion transistors and is a 360 millimeter squared die. I wanted to first point out the two CPU clusters of four cores each that are in the upper, in orange, on hopefully your monitor as well, um, in the upper right and left. Um, next, please notice uh, the GPU is basically consuming most of the diary of the chip, um, especially um, when you consider the full extent of the GPU. Um, there, the amount of diary going to the GDR6 files on the periphery, out here you see all of them, and then the SOC fabric coherency and GDR6 memory controllers is effectively mostly for the GPU. Uh, the, a a non-GPU system would have far fewer channels and far less bandwidth. And so nearly all of that diarrhea is GPU. As a result, you can understand that our graphics technical fellow, um, graphics team, and game engine developers are exceedingly happy with giving as much diarrhea as possible to the GPU, which they always love. Um, lastly, the other hardware engines are up here in the notch between the two CPU clusters, and we'll talk about them later. I'm just going to spend um, the next couple slides time on the covering, talking to this diagram and not going through the bullets. Um, on the left of the diagram, we have the two Zen 2 clusters. There are eight cores running at 3.8 gigahertz with one thread enabled or 3.6 gigahertz with two thread enabled. One Xbox extension, hardware extension to Zen 2 is SP Leap, which is additional hardware to prevent escalation of privilege attacks. We had an earlier version of SP Leap in prior Xbox One systems, but needed to redesign in the Zen architecture to work in Zen 2. SP Leap stands for Security Privilege Level S Execution and Access Protection. We also brought over the server desktop AMD CPU die Zen 2 2x floating point pipelines. When using AVX 256, this gives a peak of 32 single precision floating point operations per clock cycle, or 972 gigaflops for the eight CPU cores, which is nearly one teraflop. This, compared to prior generations, is a pretty crazy amount of the most common floating point used in game workloads. At the bottom of the diagram is the GDR6 channels with 16 gigabytes of G6 on the board. There are 320 DQ pins total running at 14 gigabit per pin per second, which results in 560 gigabytes total bandwidth. Also, the huge number 320 DRAM banks allows for higher utilizable bandwidth and lower average CPU latency, despite the very high graphics bandwidth that's uh, beating on the DRAM. At the top of the diagram are hardware accelerators, including display, video, um, and video codecs. We'll get into HSP, MSP, and the audio units in more detail later. Next, um, I wanted, wanted to speak to uh, the many new features in the hardware display processing. Display processing is the most difficult real-time engine due to large bandwidth for all display planes. It's very important to keep nearly all display processing off of the GPU's unified shader engine so more GPU perf is available for rendering. The Xbox Series X adds full linear light processing enabling extremely high quality display processing, including resizing composition between our input display planes, two of which are used by the game engine. In the early days of high dynamic range and wide color gamut content, there were often compromises made which meant some operations on, were done on gamma coded pixel values. The Xbox Series X completes upgrades of all the needed processing steps to enable math to operate on linear light values and not nonlinear gamma coded light values. This, in addition of a hardware 3D light, revolves, removes compromises and even more workload off of the GPU. 
Finally, I'd also like to quickly mention three features our team had been trying to bring to HDMI standardization since the beginning of the HDMI 2.0 efforts, and now are fully implemented in HDMI 2.1. We're very happy to see these after so many years of effort. Um, first one is ALLM, Auto Low Latency Mode, which enables console and displays to automatically pick the best low latency mode without user involvement. Next, um, VRR, Variable Rate Refresh, is a cross-company-based standard for enabling lowest latency between render and the photons emitted from the display. And third, DSC, Display Stream Compression, brought to HDMI for the first time in HDMI 2.1 enables 8K P60 pixels to have full chroma resolution instead of 420422. As mentioned before, Mark will cover the GPU in more detail. I'm going to skip slide 7. Um, you can see these on the, in the uploaded. Um, which was more, it was about Moore's Law, and that's been covered quite a bit. The, 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 main, um, the main takeaway for that was the, the, the increased overall die cost um, for roughly the same die area new process nodes. And you can see that in the, in the table in the lower left. Um, we basically have the same die area across three different technologies, and it's significantly more expensive for the die in the newest one in N7. Um, this, this works well as long as the, the additional hardware is efficient and there's software composable workloads. Okay, next. Um, now to have a look at our Microsoft created hardware engines. First, the audio engines. Um, overall, the three harder audio engines in Xbox Series X have more peak hardware single precision floating point than all the eight cores in the Xbox One X, where the CPUs ran at 2.3 gigahertz. The CFPU2 is a new hardware engine focused on efficient audio convolution, FFTs, reverb, and complex audio, complex math that audio um, commonly uses. An example of the uses of these in complex algorithms is um, Project Acoustics, where, which is a Microsoft um, effort to, to model environments, and 3D audio sources are simulated real time to produce audio sounding like real physical environments. For example, um, it would sound, you could project these 3D sounds into an environment that sounds like you're in an aircraft hangar, cave, symphony hall, or an echoey locker room with lots of occlusion. Next, Movad is a hyper real-time Opus auto hardware audio decoder with throughput matched high quality sample rate converter. It can do greater than 300 real-time channels of Opus. Opus was the most optimal quality compression trade-off audio codec that we could find, so that's what we made into hardware. Opus is more alt optimal as it has silk voice codec and silk music codec and can do hybrid variations in between per audio frame. The SRC hardware engine in Movad has greater than 100 dB signal noise ratio quality across game usage cases, which are much more difficult and varied than traditional music and voice audio. Simpler typical audio usages results in greater than 138 dB SNR, which is very high quality um, territory. The Logan engine, which was in Xbox One SOCs, is still providing lower level, more common audio processing offload. To save time, I'll quickly mention two things about HSP Pluton and MSP. The HSP continues hardware, Xbox hardware security innovations with SHAC, which stands for Secure Hardware Crypto Keys and orchestrates security operations without software, hardware, software firmware involvement. The MSP does hardware accelerated offload of high bandwidth streams of storage data to and from the NVMe SSD. Performing these workloads properly takes a great deal of CPU, but we can save the CPUs for more game engine processing reflected in better games rather than spending CPUs on repetitive crypto hash and compression. All right, this slide um, sort of describes the motivation for the Xbox for Velocity architecture. Um, the biggest thing is DRAM has had problems shrinking the capacitor now for many years. Um, this started in, you know, around 2008, eight, nine, we were getting very worried about this. Fortunately, um, Flash, in exchange has continued to cost reduce very well, and this enables subsuming the hard drive, which resulted in many NAND flash chip instances to deliver the needed bandwidth for refilling the DRAM cache. The other awesome value to users is that hard drives are doomed to have increasingly poorer load times. This is due to the inherent square term density versus linear bitrate problem. This is fixed with the NVMe SSD and the hardware software acceleration of storage. Sampler feedback streaming is a GPU innovation that Mark will go into more detail about how it actually works. But I wanted to quickly go through the high level and the effect at the SOC system level. First, 
basic background, SFS breaks into three pieces of function. First, the GPU has new hardware to directly emit metadata that records active texture portions. For example, the portions that want to be in the DRAM cache. The game developer then controls and prioritizes what to bring in and to free. Direct storage is a new API and drivers that takes it from there and manages the, the SSD, the MSP, relieving the game developer from having to deal with that complex orchestration and performance optimization. Going just a bit into why this works to deliver 2.5x game art DRAM working set effective capacity, look at the render in the upper left. This has false coloring over the rendering to show which texture level detailed map is covering which portion of each object in the scene. The red is the most detailed map. The most detailed map in, the, in a MIP chain takes 75% of texture storage due to the 1 16th pyramidal MIP map chains GPUs use. You can see the texture MIP chain for, for the active texture coverage in the lower left. In, in, that, in that rectangle with the different pieces, you can see the black area savings portion surrounding the red. That, this is the savings ratio, which we get to multiply times the 75% of texture space for the most detailed maps. There are also savings in the next map down, but as one expect, there is more active coverage in the coarser maps, but conversely, these get so much smaller that any savings becomes a tiny consideration. This, this basically leads to how we, can, how we can achieve the 2.5x game art capacity using the smaller amount of DRAM. Thanks for listening. I hope this gave some insights to a small sample of the new hardware silicon innovations in Xbox Series X. I'll now hand it off to Mark Grossman to discuss the Xbox Series X GPU and its key new hardware innovations. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, the goal for the GPU was to create a console class design that significantly advances gamers' sense of immersion in realistic worlds. Or as our VP of Game Studios says, get the tech out of the way. Naturally, we had, we had to increase the raw ops per second, but because of the cost constraint Jeff mentioned, we couldn't devote a lot of real estate to brand new functions, so we added enhancements carefully. This shows the overall RDNA-based GPU structure. It fully supports Direct 3D12, feature level 12.2 in hardware. There are four shader arrays, each with six or seven dual CUs for 26 total active. Each shader array has its own color, depth, rasterization, and primitive assembly units. A single unified geometry engine handles primitives, including mesh shading, and generates higher order surfaces. A new three-level cache hierarchy optimizes data latency and sharing. It can directly snoop the CPU caches. All of this is fed by a dual stream, multi-core command processor with custom firmware. This is uh, the workhorse of the GPU. It's the dual compute unit. It has four 32 wide SIMD units arranged to allow either 32 or 64 wide scalar thread groups and to allow sharing of local data. Each ALU lane does a fused multiply add per clock performing full rate 32-bit math and double rate 16-bit math. The faster single cycle instruction issue rate reduces stalls. The sequencer co-issues up to seven instructions of four types per cycle per CU, or 14 total for the dual unit. Architecturally, these CUs have 25% better per performance per clock on average graphics workloads relative to the GCN generation. Let's look at the evolution of GPU capability since Xbox One. The normalized graph shows that process and design advances have allowed raw shader teraflops to increase 9x. That's great. It enables some stunning visual techniques. Now note that memory space and bandwidth have grown much more slowly, only 2 to 3x. Now note the brown line. I'll uh, highlight it here on the graph. Um, the number of TV screen pixels that have to be filled has gone up almost as fast as shader power. If you average out GPU compute and memory capability, the usable, usable performance 
increase is somewhere in the four to six range, depending on the title. But we want much nicer, more realistic pixels. So how do we fill more better pixels and not blow the power budget? And the answer is architectural innovation. One important new feature is VRS, variable rate shading. Traditionally, we had to run a shader thread on every pixel or multi-sample to generate a color value. But for most things, that's overkill because you just don't have high frequency color variation everywhere as the image here on the right shows. On average, you really only need to shade every other pixel. But if you did that everywhere, you'd lose details in some places. VRS addresses this challenge, allowing screen fragments to cover up to four pixels at a time using a set of bias controls. The rate can be determined based on knowing which objects of high detail, which primitives within objects, or based on individual eight by eight pixel screen tiles. For instance, the title knows best which areas of the screen will be blurred in the post-processing stage. A programmable combination of those rates is supported and that increases or decreases the rate, the final rate, up to the global anti-aliasing amount chosen. <clears throat> Edge detail is preserved, and VRS can be used alongside other resolution enhancing techniques, including temporal AA, super resolution, and even checkerboarding. The actual amount of dedicated hardware for this is tiny, but can have a big payoff, allowing higher frame rates and more math per pixel. Another key addition is sampler feedback streaming, as Jeff mentioned. Previously, implementing, implementing partially resident textures depended on issuing soft page faults where every sample instruction returned feedback that shader code had to react to, for instance, by recording the miss in an array. Also, validating new texture pages could mean a round trip through the host memory manager, resulting in significant delays or visual glitches. In Series X, we've added two new structures in hardware to assist with tile-by-tile -tile management of a modest-sized working set of in-RAM textures. There's a residency map per texture that clamps the level of detail of each tile and a request map that records the finest mintmap level that was requested for each tile since it was last reset. Tile size is flexible. Here's a drill down on the steps. This picture here shows a textured plane, the top one using LOD0, which is the largest, most detailed map, and the other map levels below that, each a quarter of the size of the one above. The first step is to allocate virtual memory space for the entire texture, and that's pretty cheap and fast. Then we load all of the coarsest mipmap levels here up to a quarter by a quarter resolution and validate those pages. Uh, for example, a 1K by 1K texture needs 1.3 million pixels virtually. The course levels require just 87,000 pixels re to be resident, which is like 6.7%. Next step is to render. Imagine the player is you viewing the slide. The front edge of that slab is closer, therefore requires more detail. The shader executes a single macro sample instruction that combines lookup of the current detail level and the fetch of the actual texture. Here, the texture LED is clamped to two everywhere to start with, even if higher detail would have been better. Next, since the shader has already calculated which finer LED tiles should have been fetched, those values are captured in the separate recording map. Here, the closer tiles in green needed more detail. The farther tiles in red needed less than what was resident. The latter are candidates for eviction if the cache is full. Next, after rendering, the application reads back the record, compares with the current residency map, and brings in the needed higher detail tiles from Flash. Note that where an LED0 tile is needed, the corresponding region of LED1 is also loaded to provide the right detail everywhere in that region. Finally, the updated residency map is uploaded to the texture unit, and the next frame is rendered with the finer detail ready to use. And there's a second mode of the recording map that tracks access of each tile of each LED to enable texture space shading on demand. Um, we'd like these new tile maps to stay on die for low latency access, so they should be as small as possible, ideally one pixel per tile. We also want smooth transitions between the tiles. 
traditional texture bilinear interpolation sampling on a coarse map gives you wrong results because in the transition zone, you get a finer LOD clamp value where that LOD isn't resident. For example, the red tile leaking over the boundary in the left picture. Um, so with our smarter filter function, the transition zones are moved inside the coarser LED texel. So this artifact is completely avoided. And overall, with a very small incremental hardware cost, SFS gives the same or better level of visual detail with a lot lower latency and a lot lower memory cost. We do support uh, direct X ray tracing acceleration for the ultimate in realism. But in this generation, developers still want to use traditional rendering techniques evolved over decades without a performance penalty. They can apply ray tracing selectively where materials and environments demand. So we wanted a good balance of dye resources dedicated to the two techniques. The images show an example of the visual benefit of ray tracing for Minecraft. We've added hardware embedded in the compute units to perform intersections of rays with acceleration structures that represent the scene geometry hierarchy. That's a sizable fraction of the specialized ray tracing workload. The rest can be performed with uh, good quality and good real-time performance with the baseline, shader, and memory design. The overall ray tracing speed up varies a lot, but for this task, it can be up to 10 times the performance of a pure shader-based implementation. A few other architectural enhancements are notable. Um, game engines certainly can make use of machine learning inference for a variety of game-related tasks from character behavior to super resolution. So we've added a small amount of extra logic to the compute units and get up to a 10x improvement in these tasks versus using standard shader ops. Um, we also have two completely independent command streams supported from two virtual machines. Uh, the main title OS along with the system OS with work gracefully interleaving on the rest of the GPU along with work from multiple asynchronous compute queues. We also support a 32-bit high dynamic range color format for rendering and display, giving significant quality benefits compared with the 11, 11, 10 RGB format and space saving is versus using four FD16 values. So at this point, we would have liked to show a cool preview video, but uh, sorry, we won't. Uh, fortunately, you can find some nice ones out there on YouTube already. Meanwhile, please enjoy this awesome still image representing the kind of visuals you can expect from the next Xbox. So that's all we have. Thank you for playing. Thank you, uh, Jeff and Mark. And we have a lot of interest in, in, in a number of questions. And I'll let each of you guys decide which one you're going to, uh, who, which of you is going to answer them. Um, well, I think I know what the answer to the first one is going to be, but I'll ask it anyway. Is the TDP, I assume that uh, the question is referring to power, uh, of the, the Xbox, Xbox Siri, uh, Series, Series X, X GPU the same as the Xbox One's GPU? Yeah, I'll answer that. So we're not commenting on power consumption, and I'll give roughly the same answer I gave 15 years ago during the 360, at the end of the 360 talk. There's, there's so many things that are involved in the TDP, and there's, lots of, there's a huge number of trade-offs and validation and operations-related things that they're, it's not... We're not really able to describe it unless you describe all of it in a, in a reasonable technical fashion. So um, we, we don't go into that. And it, and it also relates to COGS, which we don't want to disclose. So, but thanks for asking. It's, a, it's actually a good question. We just can't answer it. Well, the uh, next question is, uh, might be a little easier to, or more possible to answer. Um, and I'm actually going to maybe change, well, the question, I'm going to change this question a little bit. Uh, the question was, is there a way to bypass the GPU's cache? And the way the question was asked it was, and right to the CPU's cache, but I, I think the way that I'd like to maybe ask to, for you to comment on is, is there a way to 
bypass the, the GPU's cache and, and stream data directly to or from memory. And if you want to comment on how that interacts with the CPU cache, yeah, yeah, please do. Let's send, the, let's send that to Mark. He, he should answer that. Mark? Mark? Uh, it's really hard to hear. Sorry, I can't hear Jeff at all. Um, so there's a whole bunch of cache modes uh, programmable um, you know, for the GPU caches. Uh, too, too many to mention, but there's uh, you know standard LRU. There's some like streaming modes, um, some bypass modes. You can mark things as coherent or not. So probably in there, there's what this person uh, questioner wants. <laughs> Well, I think one of the uh, one of the one of the possible questions related to that that I'll ask then is what about um, coherency between the GPU data and CPU data and CPU caches? Can snoop the CPU? Um, that the reverse it requires uh, software uh, intervention. Okay, okay next. next. Um, wow question that, uh, to that I'm going to uh, uh, field to you is, are you happy with uh, DirectX 12 as a, low over, as a low overhead API? Do you have a lower overhead API that's closer to the hardware? Um, DirectX 12 <laughs> is, I mean, there's a lot of it that um, is left to, to the user, like you know, lots more of the memory management aspects um, there's, there's some Xbox specific enhancements that, um, the power, power users, power developers can use. Um, but, um, overall, you know, we, we try to have co consistency between the Xbox, uh, implementation of titles and PC. So having a lot of divergence is, is not good, but I think overall, um, you know, we work with developers extensively in the early stages of architecture to make sure that their highest priority needs are, are met. Um, so haven't heard too many complaints so far, but then I'm a silicon guy, so maybe they just haven't, uh, haven't dialed I'd, me up yet. I'd like to add something to that, John. Go ahead. Um, so the, th this has been said before in Xbox, and this has been true since the original Xbox. We have a smash driver model that takes the HAL and the runtime layer and smashes it together. And the games on the game binary are implement the hardware laid out data that the hardware GPU eats directly. So it's not a HAL layer abstraction um, and it makes it significantly more efficient. Uh, Microsoft also pretty much rewrite, so basically we completely rewrite the driver, um, smash it together, and this is Andrew Goosen's team in Sigma which does a fantastic job on this and re replaces that and pretty much all the firmware in the GPU with Microsoft written firmware. And so we, we are, it's significantly, significantly more efficient than in the PC. So we've got several questions on the uh, subject of clock frequencies. Um, so I'll kind of lump them together into a couple of questions. One is, is there a, uh, linkage between the CPU and GPU clocks, or can they be, are they independent of each other? They're independent. I mean, the hardware is independent. It's, I mean, there's policy things that are decided above the hardware. And then uh, the re a related question is, is the uh, CPU 3.8 gigahertz clock a, a all the time clock, or is that a turbo frequency? That's an all the time clock. There's been a lot of work um, in our team to have low dynamic range variation um, depending on the workload. So there's been a decent amount of um, work to ensure that. So game developers don't have to deal with, oh, I'm running through a certain code path with this dynamic data and now I'm seeing lots of variation on my frame rate. That's, that, that's difficult for game developers. And the uh, next one, this will probably be for you too, Jeff. Um, is the TSMC 7 nanometer that's used, is it, a, um, is it the same as N, is N7P, N7 plus, or is it some unique flavor of 7 nanometer? Yeah, I, 
That's, that's a good question. Um, TSMC would know the comparative better than me. Um, it's definitely like, you know, from, you know, Apple to what, two and a half years ago started production in N7. It's, it's definitely the progressed over time and a lot of production engineering and improvements to get the, the ion currents up and, and basically hit the performance targets we required for the CPU. The, there was a lot of work between AMD and TSMC to hit what we needed to have an AMD CPU be what we, what we needed and wanted to have for an out-of-order CPU core. And um, next question, probably also for you. Um, the, um, in your presentation, you've said that the uh, Zen 2 CPUs are server class, but it seems like the, the cache sizes are, are more of a mobile class. Do you, do you have any Yeah, the, the, I mean, the that? L3s are different. I, I can, the problem is, is I can't say too much because I might say things that are AMD, <laughs> AMD confidential. So, um, I hesitate to go beyond that. Well, so let's quickly go on to the, a couple more questions because we are uh, we have run over, but we're also the last presentation today. So, until the unless the production team starts getting will start getting mad at us, but uh, we'll, we'll take a, squeeze in a couple more. Um, first, uh, with um, twenty channels of GDR six, is that really Cheaper. I'm paraphrasing it a little bit, but is that really cheaper than two stacks of HVM? So, I mean, just to be clear, we're not we're not religious about which, you know, DRAM technology to use. Uh, we just we needed the GPU to have a ton of bandwidth, and for us to be able to have lots of channels and memory banks um, to 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 have independent channels, so we have lower latency for the CPUs to sneak in and get their get their reads serviced. So um, if, if there was any hope of HBM being cheaper, we, <laughs> there, was, there was actually HBM LC that was being considered a while back, and um, basically different customers voted with their feet based on seeing the prices for HBM, and that was dropped in JEDEC. So, um, so anyway, I mean, it's, it's really about what HBM costs, and, and, and it would just cost too much, frankly. And we can, we can get the bandwidth, we absolutely can get the bandwidth we need out of GDR6, so. That was the right solution. So a related question. On the die, on the die diagram, uh, why are there doubled up GDR6 phi's on the left and right instead of having some of them on the bottom of edge? Oh, the bottom is it's about the, the power delivery and the, the way the board interfaces to the chip. Um, the, the GPU, as you can see, is rather massive, and so it has really high EDC. Um, and current current requirements, and you need to have relatively clean copper to not be all Swiss cheesed up, so that it, so it has like problems with delivery of the current to the to the GPU and to the package. So when you have that much current coming in, you have to leave quite a bit of space unless you're going to go to incredibly fancy, expensive packaging. So the way the way that we did it is it's rel relatively common and um, a pretty cost efficient way to do it. So here's one that I think is a bit of a, uh, should be a softball for, for game programmers, but it's what are, what are the applications that need so much math um, dedicated? To, what are the applications that, <clears throat> that need so much sound processing? Yeah, so that, I love this question because I, I love audio, and um, we have a lot, of, a lot of people really passionate about audio in Microsoft. Um, so as soon as you get into um, 3D positional audio and you're simulating real world spaces, and then uh, there's, a, there's a thing that MSR Asia did a few years ago that, that allows us to, to simulate real world spaces and that's being brought to Xbox. And it requires, I mean, if you have three or four or 500 um, audio 3D positional sounds, and then and on top of that, if you wanna do HRTFs, it's, it's a huge amount of compute. Uh, it's it's a crazy crazy amount of compute, and so and especially if you start including occlusion and other things that really then make it sound like a real world space. I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to being in the living room and have it sound like you're in some cave and you know there's like fighting going on or whatever, or you're just wandering through on a platformer and it really sounds like this totally different world, and that's imprinted on what you hear in your room. Um, that that would be that would be pretty awesome. We've been looking forward to that. 
Well, we've already kept the, uh, the, the staff here for about 10 minutes over, so I think we will wrap it up at this point. But again, thank you for attending uh, uh, Hot Chips today and, and for the uh, GPU and gaming session. And thank our uh, our presenters. I thank all of our presenters during the session, but uh, especially the last two that are that are here now. Thank, thank you, John. You.